Welcome to FRC Media News for Thursday, July 30th, 2020. I'm Keith Tebow. This week, as schools still work out their plans on reopening this fall, we get the perspective from local teachers. It looks like more Fall River voters will avail themselves of mail ballots this fall. Diamond Vogue celebrates the class of 2020. We speak with two freshman members of the Fall River City Council, and a local artist uses his talents to dramatically portray the struggles of the Vietnam War. All this and more coming up. The Fall River School Department last week unveiled the first draft of a plan to reopen schools in the fall in the face of COVID-19. A final plan is still a few weeks away. And the state this week announced that school districts can delay opening by 10 days to better prepare for what an in-person school day will look like. How do teachers feel about returning? We spoke this week with Rebecca Cusick, president of the Fall River Educators Association. In short, members still have plenty of concerns. But she says with schools allowed to delay their opening by 10 days, that will provide the time to educate and prepare staff and buildings for any in-person instruction. Giving these 10 days to districts, what they have done is allow schools to phase in reopening in a way that is responsible and safe. So those 10 days can be dedicated to um, training staff, as well as to communicating with parents, um, to learning about um, how to best engage kids remotely. Um, you know, when we return, we're going to have a lot of new safety protocols. A lot of things are going to look very different and staff need to be on the same page. We have to have common understandings as to what those protocols are. And then we also have to be able to communicate those protocols to parents and to students. And, and in order to do that well, I think we're going to need those 10 days to plan and prepare for the kids to reenter the buildings. The current draft plan is preparing for three scenarios, a full in-person return of students, a full remote plan, and a hybrid of in-person and remote learning. Cusick says the opinion of FREA members varies. We have done two surveys of our membership. We represent about 850 um, educators in Fall River. And um, both surveys were pretty similar in that the membership is sort of split on where they're at in this moment of time. Um, I think that probably half or a little more than half um, are willing to engage in a hybrid model. And I'd say about 45% of our members, you know, just again, this is a snapshot survey, are preferring a remote model. And the reasons for that vary anywhere from they have pre-existing health conditions and they're not quite sure um, how protected they'll be in the buildings, even if there are masks. Um, and I think that the other concern they have is if they live with somebody who has a pre-existing health condition. Um, you're right about the unions when um, the Mass Teachers Association and the um, other unions that joined them with the Commissioner of Education met, they were insisting on all buildings being inspected to make sure that the air quality was safe upon return because we know this virus is airborne. Um, I know the superintendent has a plan for addressing HVAC systems in the buildings. Um, I think as we learn more about what that plan is and what the hybrid plan looks like, I'm hoping people start to feel more comfortable. Um, but definitely, you know, there are health concerns that I'm not sure we're going to be able to alleviate 100 percent. So what options do teachers have if they feel uncomfortable returning to school if there is in-person instruction? Cusick says that is under discussion. We can bargain over that issue um, when we bargain over the return to school. Um, but the district has been clear that they want to work with us um, to help those people. We know that parents are going to have the right to um, not send their child back to school and instead um, engage in remote learning. So we would try to advocate for those teachers with health conditions or who live with people with health conditions to get first crack at those remote teaching positions. Um, so, you know, that would mean that they would be in a more sheltered environment, not exposed to as many kids. Um, that's what, you know, we would try to bargain for them. And the district has uh, said they're going to do a survey probably this week of staff because they're curious as well um, how many uh, people have health conditions that they're worried about returning to the buildings with. 
Despite so many unknowns as to how the school year will shake out, Cusick feels Superintendent Matthew Malone has been extremely responsive to and understanding of union members' concerns. We educators want to get back to the classroom. We absolutely prefer being in person with the kids to um, any sort of remote model. But you're right, health and safety has to be a priority um, because if we become infected or our students become infected, you know, that impacts the community in which we all live. So um, it's a, a public health issue. And um, as far as our relationship with the superintendent, um, I think both of us recognize that in these extraordinary times, if we don't work together and we don't continue to collaborate, we're never going to make this make it through this. I mean, this is um, such a complicated issue uh, for everybody and, you know, parents, students, staff members that we need to communicate with each other consistently. Uh, we need to be clear and we need to be understanding. And, um, you know, he has done a nice job of sharing information with us and is willing to meet with us to hear what we have to say, too. So um, we're continuing to collaborate over this because it's probably the most important issue we've tackled together yet. When the pandemic forced students into remote learning, Cusick said teachers adapted quickly with the focus on ensuring students could gain access to lessons and not be left behind. We all learned very quickly how to um, use technology to engage with our kids and connect with our families. Our number one priority was to connect with families to find out, um, you know, was everybody okay? Were the kids, um, you know, being supported at home? What could we do to make things easier for them? Checking on those social emotional um, needs that kids have. And then, you know, we transitioned to a more academic phase where we did put together paper packets to ensure equity because we know not every family has access to internet. Um, so we had to find a way to make sure all kids could do the work. Um, and then as we progressed even further, uh, the school committee approved sending home Chromebooks to all families. So that helped us engage even more students than we had previously um, with paper, you know, pencil and paper, hard copies being available for those families that still could not access uh, via internet. But I give everybody a lot of credit I don't think I would call it um, remote teaching, but I think I would call it crisis teaching because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were learning on the fly and we were figuring things out as we went. And um, I have to give everybody credit for being flexible and um, for learning quickly. But I think we could do a lot better and be more thoughtful in our approach to remote learning uh, in the future if we find ourselves in that situation again. Some election news now with the state primary about a month away. Fall River Mayor Paul Coogan has made his intentions known on who he will support in the Democratic primary in the Massachusetts 4th Congressional District. The mayor this week announced he will support Newton City Councilor Jake Auchincloss in the September 1st primary. There are nine Democrats and two Republicans on the primary ballot. We spoke to all 11 candidates in the race. You can view their entire interviews by visiting our website. It appears a large number of Fall River residents will take advantage of reserving a mail ballot for both the primary and general elections this fall. A week after mail ballot applications were sent to state voters, Fall River Election Commission Chairwoman Kelly Susie Young says her office has already received 7,000 requests for mail ballots out of total registered voters of approximately 50,000. She says that number far outpaces total voter counts for previous state elections. Based on our, our numbers in the past, um, the 2018 state primary, we've only, we only had 5,200 voters. And then the 2016 primary, we only had about 2,900 voters. So it, I'm hoping this will be a good turnout with everybody the majority of people voting by mail. With a large number of mail ballot applications expected to be received, Susie Young says the processing of applications and mail ballots are clearly defined. Once we receive the application from the voter, we process it on whether they want one election or both elections. We process it by if they gave us a separate mailing address, and if um, they had to pick a party. From there, it gets treated like our absentee um, applications. We put a packet together, mail them out the ballot, and once, the, once they vote, send it back to us. We process it in-house, in basically letting the system know that they did vote 
From there, it goes to the polls on election day where the poll worker will check them in that they voted and they will get credit for voting. The deadline to return mail ballot applications to the elections office is August 26th. 328 members of the class of 2020 at Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School received their diploma at a delayed but in-person ceremony held on Saturday. The graduation exercises consisted of two sessions, which split the class in half, with one session held in the morning and the second later in the afternoon. Class valedictorian Landon Beejan expressed the feelings of many of his peers that being away from school to close out their senior year was not the kind of ending they expected. But through the challenges, they persevered. But despite our varied circumstances, every one of us has experienced what it's like to be stuck inside. When we should have been going to school and seeing our friends, we all know how it felt to find out that something dear to us was canceled. Whether it was a basketball game, track meet, birthday celebration, April vacation plans, or prom. Many of us put hours into our activities, practicing our sport for states, preparing for the spring season, studying for USA or DECA. And to have those end goals shut down, it hurts. It feels like all the work we put in was for nothing. And we've all felt that. We all know how it feels to lose the end of our senior year. But we also discovered our ability to improvise alternatives to these losses. When we couldn't have gatherings for our birthdays, we improvised with small parades. When we couldn't see our friends in person, we FaceTimed, we Zoomed, we found socially distanced ways to stay connected. Sure, these aren't plan A, they aren't what we wanted, they aren't what any of us wanted, but they worked. And these shared experiences are what make our class stronger. As we head into life or college, the workforce or military, whatever the next challenge in our lives may be, there's a good chance that plan A may elude us again. And the fact that we know how to embrace plan B, C, or D now is a lesson we will take with us forever. We will use this creativity to tackle whatever obstacles life throws at us. So my advice to you all is this. Don't look back on the things that we never did. Don't focus on the fun that we could have had, but rather on the opportunity and experiences that await us in our upcoming lives. Because with our improvisations and skills that we have used in this crisis, I know that we, the class of 2020, will do amazing things. We are Diamond Strong. Thank you. Beginning on Monday, the City of Fall River will begin its semi-annual water system flushing program. Flushing will continue across the city until September 18th. Now, residents may experience some temporary water discoloration during this time. As a precaution, the city is asking that you check your water prior to washing laundry. We'll have more FRC Media News right after this. Here are some job descriptions on the latest hot jobs list from the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center. Office Assistant Matrix Transport Service is looking for a full-time office assistant responsible for composing memos, transcribing notes, and researching and creating presentations. Job number 13810875. Front End Server. Letty's Bakery, located at 1481 South Main Street, is seeking a full-time front-end server to take customer orders, fulfill orders for pickup, and maintain storefront display cases. Job number 1380-6264. Physician Assistant, St. Anne's Hospital, located at Middle Street, is looking for a full-time physician assistant to identify and assess problems while interviewing and examining patients and clearly communicate with supervising physician, patients, and their families. Job number 13807623. Innovative Defense Technologies, located at 10 North Main Street, is in need of the following full and part-time positions. Test Automation Engineer, job number 13802660. Junior Software Engineer, job number 13793332. 
Family Service Association, located at 101 Rock Street, also is in need of the following full and part-time positions. Vice President of Community Support, job number 1380717A. Care Coordination Supervisor, job number 1377983A. For more information on these or other positions, visit Mass Hire Job Quest at jobquest.dcs.eol.mass.gov or call the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center at 508-730-5000. Welcome back. Three Fall River City Councilors are serving their first term in office. We had the opportunity to speak with freshman councilors Trot Lee and Christopher Peckham on their thoughts after the first six months. Both councilors expressed appreciation in the support they have received from council leadership and their peers, and both were surprised by how city residents seek their assistance. Whenever I have questions to council president, to council vice president, um, to some of the older uh, and more experienced councilors, everyone's been really good at you know having a conversation, even in the council meetings, just um, being able to have a pretty good dialogue with everyone. One of the things that um, I anticipated that is probably more than I anticipated would be the constituent uh, piece where um, you, you're, not, you're, fielding, you're fielding phone calls and you're fielding um, uh, just requests or you, you're, you're asked to be at meetings and things like that, uh, that people are having around the, around the city. Uh, again, with COVID-19 in, involved, it's been harder to... Uh, to, to get to those to those meetings or a lot of those meetings to get canceled and things like that. Um, but I, I do appreciate that part. I think I, I'm, I'm, if I could say that I have a favorite part of this, I think that has been uh, the best part is um, the community outreach piece that that I really wanted to uh, I really wanted to make a prominent piece in in my city council uh, service. I, I wanted to be in the community and uh, continuing what I've done as a, as a civilian in, uh, in, in community outreach. I, I haven't obviously had a chance to do it as much as I'd like to, but I do get mm. there when I can. Things that have surprised me is the, the amount of uh, attention from the community. Um, that's a big part of why I, I ran and I get a lot of calls for help and I'm able to do so. And that makes me uh, feel like I, the reason I'm completing the reason I ran for the position. Cliff and Pam have been excellent uh, right from the jump. When it came to questions and uh, protocol, what to do, uh, you know what I'm saying? They, they were excellent. Uh, they came to us right away, said, whatever you need, let us know. We know you, the three of you are new to this. Um, whatever you need, feel free to reach out. And they've been excellent. Uh, working with the other counselors, excellent as well. I feel that we have a, a great team, a well-rounded team. Um, when it comes to, for instance, I everybody knows I'm a public safety guy. Uh, Sean's a great finance guy. Linda's great with constituent services. Leo, Trot with the environment. Uh, Michelle, the budget, she tears it apart. I, I think we have a great team, uh, all nine of us. Public safety is a big priority for both counselors. Counselor Lee says he understands the defund police movement, but believes city police have set a positive example for all. You know, there's been a lot of argument about racism in the police departments around the country and things like that. And, and I myself recognize that, um, you know, there has been systemic racism in police departments since the beginning of our, of our country, but in Fall River specifically, um, we have, we have hardworking police officers and then there's, there's hardworking police officers all, all over the country, but I've, I've had a front row seat over the few years to see uh, a police department that is understaffed and it doesn't get the amount of money that it probably uh, could or should from uh, in comparison to other towns and cities um, and they work hard and they, they do they do what they can is it perfect it's definitely not perfect I don't think anybody's perfect I'm not perfect you know how that goes but I do respect and appreciate uh, the work that the police department does and and I could say that about the fire department as well and and you know all these other entities that that, that you got a lot of hard-working people. Consular Peckham says he has been impressed by the leadership within the police department and wants to support their needs the new chief's been phenomenal. Um, the mayor as well, when it comes to public safety, every time I have an issue or a question, people come to me with public safety issues. I'll go to the mayor and then go to the chief. And um, both of them, first, second ring, pick up the phone right away. Um, the chief especially, 
very community uh, minded, proactive. I usually talk to them one, maybe daily or every other day to see what's going on. Um, I believe that working relationship is excellent. Uh, and we've got a great chief. I want to know exactly um, what they need. I, I know in the past, um, chiefs and, and uh, this goes back quite a few years, um, they try to stay conservative. I just put it all out there. Tell us what you need. We'll pick, pick it apart. And um, it, that way, nothing goes unfunded at the end of the year. Um, we spend the money that's allocated to that department and we're not giving it back and coming up with the issue we had at the last uh, uh, city council meeting where supply money had gone back and we were having people donating supplies during COVID. So there was some miscommunication. All city councilors also serve on a variety of subcommittees. Councilor Lee serves on the Ordinance Committee, Real Estate Committee, and chairs the Health and Environmental Affairs Committee, an assignment he welcomes because of his support for increased composting. We, we talked about composting, so that's actually going to go into the Ordinance Committee. Fortunately, I'm on that. Um, and that was that was actually facilitated uh, by, by Mr. Uh, John Perry, Perry more than more than anybody. He he told me uh, in one of the council meetings on when we were doing Zoom meetings, he's like, Councilor, I heard you out there on the on the on the campaign trail, uh, almost almost word for word. And he said, uh, we want to establish uh, at least an opportunity for people to compost. And uh, and and my and my, I would like to see the composting, uh, hopefully, be effective enough that it can bring down some of the solid waste costs, and we can do something productive, uh, mm. you know, for the environment in the city. Councilor Peckham says, along with public safety, the environment and neighborhoods are among his committee assignments. I'm on the environmental uh, committee with TROT. Um, that's another one that I, I I would love to learn more about. I'm glad I was put on that. Um, I know TROT's excellent with uh, that within the city. Um, I also am a liaison to the neighborhood associations, which I love because they, the, uh, Neighborhood Association presidents are very proactive with public safety, so I'm able to go back and forth with them and and hear their complaints, their concerns. Um, and actually, I get a lot of positive feedback with the police department being in in their neighborhoods. They're happy to see them um, down by the uh, the waterfront. We have a walk walk and beat sometimes down there, so I'll get phone calls saying, "Hey, can you thank the chief for having the cops down there? It, it was appreciated. We we feel safer." So I, I think. Uh, all of them kind of go hand in hand, especially environmental can go along with public safety as well. Um, it, there's a lot of environmental concerns that uh, roadways can fit into environmental concerns, sidewalks, stuff like that. And I know uh, Council Lee is big on the, uh, the trash and the recycling, so uh, I, I'd like to learn a lot from him. We'll have more FRC Media News right after this. Thank you for considering a homeless pet today. I hope you enjoy what you're about to see. And as always, please feel free to contact the shelter before coming down to make sure that the pets you're viewing are still available for adoption. We can be reached at 508-677-9154. Hi, welcome to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. Today we have Donald. He is a Silky Terrier mix. He did come in as a stray, so we have him estimated about between six years old and eight. He's very sweet. He does get along with other dogs and cats. He's, for a middle-aged man, he, he's actually very playful. He loves squeaky toys. He loves tennis balls. Yeah, he would get along with other dogs and cats. But from what I gathered, um, he doesn't really know any, he doesn't know commands. Um, he doesn't know the, even the basic ones. Um, he does really well on a leash. Um, he does, there's no attention walking him. He walks right by your side. So come down and meet Donald. Um, we, I know he'd love to meet you. We are located at 300 Linwood Street in Fall River, Massachusetts at Forever Pause. Welcome back to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. And today we have Miss Greta. She's a two-year-old female with a long to medium coat who's been here for about three weeks. As you can see, she's very sweet with people. And right now she's in a communal room with cats, but she's in a cage. So we're still kind of learning how she is with other cats, see if she plays well with friends or not. But she is very sweet with people. She's pretty young, so she still has some energy, but she also likes to lounge and cuddle and take naps too. So she's a very good cat. 
And as you can see, she's very pretty too. So if you'd like to meet Greta, you can come down to Forever Paws Animal Shelter on 300 Linwood Street. And I'm sure she'd love to meet you too. Finally this week, our Denise Pumaguaye spoke with a local artist who is using his talents to portray the bravery and struggles of those who fought in the Vietnam War. So to help get the painting right, um, you know, I start off with some sketches and some drawings, which are nice and any artist might like them or anybody casually passing by might like it. But to have the authenticity of the war, you, you, I, you needed to talk to people who were there. And the veterans were able to walk me through almost every part of the process, whether it be a small buckle on the, on the straps, uh, the dog tags and the rim on the dog tags or the knife or the, or the canteen mm -hmm. or the way the gun is or having the mustache or a cigarette or the light lens. So many little parts that I would have missed without having their guidance. And they would come back to the studio and sit down and look at the painting throughout the process and point things out. And then I would work on them and call them back in a week. And then they would come back and the process continued for about six months. And, um, I changed it so many times and it was quite the process, but in the end, we were all happy with um, the way it turned out. So in six months and seven months of talking with Joe Marshall and Justin Latini and Harry Terrian and some of the other, Billy Damaris and some of the others, you get a, there's a much broader story to tell. So we finished that project. I think it was very successful. In my heart, felt like I wanted to continue telling the story of the veterans. So I took it upon myself to come up with some other ideas. There's five more paintings I want to add to the series. And all the veterans graciously agreed to come back and help me with their input, which I desperately need when it comes to this stuff. And it'll be invaluable. One quick note, due to construction ongoing at Bristol Community College, Channel 95 will be off the air tomorrow, Friday, July 31st. We hope to be back on Saturday, August 1st. We apologize for any inconvenience. That'll do it for this edition of FRC Media News. Please check out our website, frmedia.org, for all the latest news and information, as well as information about our Channel 95 program schedule. This program can be seen Thursdays at 6 p.m. and Fridays at 5.30 p.m. For all of us here at FRC Media News, I'm Keith Tebow. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next Thursday.